from our archives, the Billy Graham Classics. And now before the message, here's a song from George Beverly Shea. Tonight, I want to talk about Jesus Christ. I want to ask the question, who is Jesus? Many of us have crosses in, embossed on our Bibles or on our carrying around our neck, but we don't really know Jesus. You know, when you fly into Brazil, into Rio de Janeiro, there's a great big statue of Jesus. It's a landmark of Rio, day and night. It stands 130 feet high. It's 130 feet from fingertip to fingertip with his arms outstretched. Someone has called this, in this country, the Year of Jesus. One of the networks recently ran a mini-series on Jesus. My daughter has written a book called Just Give Me Jesus. There's a movement among teenagers that asks the question, what would Jesus do? Almost everybody has heard of Jesus, but millions don't know, really know who he is. They don't have him in their lives and in their hearts. And the world today is looking for Messiah to come and save us. Many years ago, the prophet Ezekiel said, I searched for a man among them, but I found none. In other words, God was searching for someone that he could put his hand on and bless and use, and he couldn't find anybody that was willing to totally surrender and commit their lives to him. The world today, if you read the newspapers and watch the telecast, news telecast, is rushing madly toward, I think, Armageddon. Tonight in the Middle East, they're battling again over the same things they've battled for hundreds of years. They've had meeting after meeting and truce after truce and treaty after treaty and promises made by all around. But somehow they can't quit their fighting. You see, man is a moral failure. God is our only hope. God's plans God's plans are already formed and are clearly stated in the scriptures. And at his right hand in heaven sits a man who was despised and ignored and rejected by men when he came to earth the first time and who is still rejected and ignored by the majority of the human race. God has pledged that he will be the future world ruler. He will put down all rule and all authority and power. There's coming a day when every knee will bow to him and every tongue will confess his name. This year, 2000 AD, the calendar we use each day dates back to the birth of Jesus. We can't get away from him. Our generation cannot escape Jesus. Over the years, so many plays and books and operas and movies have been made about Jesus. In March and April, both Newsweek and U.S. News and World Report magazines had cover stories about him. In its Science and Ideas cover story, U.S. News carried the title, why did Jesus die? Why is there so much interest in Jesus today? Is that the question you've asked? Who is this person who has done so much to transform human history than any man that ever lived? He only lived 33 years. His longest journey was less than 100 miles. Is he just a folk hero or a revolutionary? 
Or is he, is he who he claimed to be? The son of the living God. Who is this person that demands we call him son of God and follow him even to death? We know he was a man. He was completely human. He was the representative man. He was the all-out man. He was identified and numbered with the transgressors, the scripture says. Eighty-three times in the New Testament, he's called the Son of Man. There are many places in the scriptures where we are reminded of his humanity. The Bible teaches that he was hungry. The Bible teaches that he was tired. In the back of a boat, he was asleep. He knew the joys of friendship. He was misunderstood and despised. He wept at the tomb of a loved one. He had to fight temptation and endure disappointment. He claimed to be the unique son of God. Before the world ever was or before the human race ever existed, he said in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. And Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. With these words, Jesus set himself aside from every other person that ever lived. In other words, Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I always am the eternal present. There's no past with Jesus and there's no future with Jesus. It's all in the ever present. And he's speaking to you tonight and he's speaking to all of us collectively and individually. In Colossians 1 it says, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions, or principalities or powers. All things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things hold together. This whole stadium would fly to pieces were it not for the fact that he is the thing that holds it together. Peter's statement in Matthew 16, 16, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. When he came at Bethlehem, that was not his birth or his beginning. He had already, already, already existed. That was his incarnation. When Jesus came to Bethlehem, it wasn't the place of his origin. It was his incarnation. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. You know, it's interesting to me that Jesus never apologized for sin. He challenged others to prove any error in his thinking or in anything that he ever did. How do we explain Jesus from every other individual that ever lived? How do we explain Jesus from every other person? What is the basic cause of hate and greed and lust and war today? and racial injustice and racial division. Jeremiah said, gave the answer. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? King David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. I was born in sin, said David. He said, I was shapen in iniquity. The Bible says in Matthew 15, for out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, and blasphemies. I think we need to do something about guns, but that's not the real problem. The real deep problem is in our hearts. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts and murders and adulteries and thefts and blasphemous. All of these things come from the heart of men and women. How do you explain Jesus? His authority. No one ever spoke as this man spoke, says John 7. He forgave sin. No other prophet had ever forgiven sin. Muhammad didn't attempt that. Buddha didn't do that. No one else in history has ever said your sins are forgiven. He also had authority over nature. When the sea was boiling and the storm was raging, he just held up his hand and said, peace be still, and the sea quieted down and the storm stopped. 
He had authority over disease. Every sick person that ever came to him by faith and he touched, he healed. But what about his death? Different than any other person that ever was. You see, Jesus was executed. He was a criminal. He took our sins. He became sin for us who knew no sin. Can you imagine a person being the embodiment of sin? That's what Jesus was on the cross. Isaiah 53 says, God hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. In 1 Peter 2.24 it says, Who his own self bare our sins in his body on the tree. Micah says that all of our sins are cast into the depths of the sea. I was reading today about that lake in Russia. That's the deepest water in the whole world. Thousands of feet down. Our sins are buried in the depths of the sea, the scripture says, because of what Christ did on the cross. He became sin for us. He was executed for you. He took your judgment and your hell. You won't ever have to go to hell. You don't ever have to go before the great white throne judgment if you're in Christ. But everybody else will. The Bible says that there's coming a day when he's going to judge the whole world. And you will stand before God at the great judgment, hundreds of you that are here tonight. And you won't stand with a great crowd like this tonight. You say, oh, we'll have a good time when we get there. No, you'll be alone. You're going to stand before God alone and give an account of what you did with Jesus and how you lived your life. And many of us are going to be terribly disappointed. And we're going to scream for mercy. But it's going to be too late. The Bible says that we will call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on top of us and hide us from him that sits on the throne. But we can't. And the crucifixion of Christ is a stumbling block to many people because it's foolishness, the Bible says, to those that perish. Many will accept the teaching of Christ when he says, love everybody. But they stop at the cross. At the cross is where you have to come before you can really know him. And you have to confess that you're a sinner. And you have to repent from sin. And the word repentance means that you turn, that you change. You're going one direction in your life and you're willing to go another. You say, but Billy, I don't have that ability. I've tried to change. I've tried to do better. But I can't. No, you can't. But God will help you if you submit to him and say, Lord, I need your help. I need your help even to repent. I need your help even to have faith to believe the kind of faith that I must have. What about you? And then there's his resurrection. The Bible says that they took him out and they buried him after his death. But on the third day he rose again. And he's alive tonight. When some of the disciples went out to the tomb where he was buried, there were two men there, two angels, that said, why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Jesus is alive. And the thing which inspired the disciples to go to the whole world with the gospel is the resurrection. We're talking about a living Christ that can come into your life and heart today and change you and change your family and change your neighborhood and change Nashville and change Middle Tennessee and change all of the whole country if we'll let him. The Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. 
You have to believe that he not only died, but that he rose again. That's one half of it. One half is that you repent. You come and say, oh Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm sorry that I've sinned. Please forgive me and help me to change. But then you have to live the life. And there the resurrected Christ is there through the Holy Spirit to help you live the life after you've come to Christ. If Christ is not risen, then he's not God. And the tremendous force in history is unexplained. The Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus was persecuting Christians and killing Christians. He hated Jesus. And one day there was a blinding light and he fell down on his knees and he knew it was Jesus. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? In Acts, the ninth chapter. And this is the question you must answer. Who is Jesus? That's the question of our generation. Who is Jesus? Jesus claimed, if Jesus claimed to be God, knowing that he was not, he was a deceiver. If he thought that he was God and didn't know the difference, he was a maniac. Jesus was whom he claimed to be. God manifested in the flesh. Think of it, the mighty God that created those stars and those planets and this whole universe and holds it all together. He is the one that wants to come into your life, in your heart tonight, in a new way. Oh, you might be a member of the church, you might have been confirmed and baptized and all the rest, but deep down inside you're just not sure. You're not certain that you're ready to meet God. You're not certain that you'll escape that great judgment. You must face the question that Pilate asked. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? Pilate washed his hands. Tonight you can wash your hands and leave. And leave this stadium and go back to the old life and nothing has happened. But Paul was fearful. He was trembling. He was astonished. He was amazed. But he asked the right question. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And Jesus said unto him, Arise and go. And that's what Jesus is saying to you tonight up in those stands and down here on this little stand. Arise and go. Get up out of your seat and make a new commitment to Jesus and make certain that your sins are forgiven. You see, this may be the only chance you'll ever have the rest of your life is tonight. You may not be able to come back to these meetings this week. You may never have another moment quite like this when the Holy Spirit has spoken to you as he's speaking tonight. And Jesus says in Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him and fellowship with him. Jesus is knocking at your heart's door tonight. He wants to come into your heart. He wants to change your life. He wants to have an impact in your community and in your family and in your life. He wants to give you peace and joy that you've never known before. He wants to forgive all your sins and he wants to give you assurance that if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. You can have that assurance tonight before you leave here. And I'm going to ask you to do something that may be very difficult for you to do. But when Jesus died on that cross, he was dying for you because he loved you. And he's asking you to come in to open your heart to him tonight. And if there's a doubt in your life about your relationship to Christ, you get up out of your seat right now and come and stand in front here on this beautiful stadium floor that they've put down. If you're with friends or relatives, they'll wait on you. And come and stand here, and we're, I'm going to say a word to you and have a prayer with all of you and give you some literature to help you before you, in your life, 
in the week to come. You get up and come right now, men, women, young people, hundreds of you. Just get up and come and stand here. That's all. By that act, you're saying to God, I do open my heart to Jesus who died for me and who rose again and who's alive tonight. And he's knocking at my heart's door. I can sense it. You get up and come. We're going to wait on you right now. If you've come with a group, they'll wait on you. If you've come in a bus, they'll wait. There's plenty of time. This is the most important moment in your life. Don't miss it. Quickly, from the up in the top stands, you get up and come. It'll take you a little time. It'll take you four or five minutes, so come. We're going to be here to pray with you and to talk with you and to help you. While you're still coming, I want to say a word to all of you that will be watching by television. And you can make your commitment where you are. Wherever you are, you may be at home, you may be in a hotel room. I don't know where you are, but God is speaking to you. You make your commitment. Or you can call that number that you see on the screen. And there's somebody ready to talk to you right now and have a prayer with you. And we'll send you the same literature that we're going to give to people here tonight. You can make your commitment. You make it now. If you just prayed that prayer with my father, or if you have any questions about a relationship with Jesus Christ, I would just call that number that is on the screen. There'll be someone there to talk with you, pray with you, and answer those questions. And remember, God loves you. If you would like to commit your life to Jesus Christ, please call us right now toll free at 1-877-772-4559. That's 1-877-772-4559. Or you can write to us at Billy Graham, 1 Billy Graham Parkway, Department C, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28201. Or you can contact us on the web 24-7 at peacewithgod.tv. We'll get the same helps to you that we give to everyone who responds at the invitation. On behalf of Franklin Graham and the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, thank you for watching and thank you for your prayers. You're invited on a journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. Retrace Billy Graham's path from humble farm boy to international ambassador of God's love through multimedia, photos, and memorabilia. But the fruit of the Spirit is love! That is a Tour the restored Graham family home place, browse Ruth's attic bookstore, and have a meal at the Graham Brothers Dairy Bar. Enjoy special exhibits, events, and seasonal activities for the whole family. Admission is free, so come walk this journey of discovery at the Billy Graham Library. We are to wait for the coming of Christ with patience. We are to watch with anticipation. Scripture says... 
Christ is coming when you Tonight I want you to turn with me to the Old Testament, to Joshua, the 24th chapter. Joshua, as you know, was a great military leader. And he took the place of Moses when Moses went to be with the Lord. And the 15th verse. Now he had called all the leaders of Israel together at a place called Shechem. And he's getting ready to die. And this is his farewell address. And during this address, he warns the people about their idolatry. He warns them that the judgments of God will fall upon them unless they live for the Lord. And here's what he says. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. If you want to serve the devil, serve him. But make a choice. Whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But then he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, if every one of you serves other idols and other gods, makes no difference. As for me and my house, we've already made a decision. We are going to serve the Lord. And that's a decision that every single person here tonight has to make. You either have to decide that you're going to serve the gods of materialism all around us, or the true and the living God. And Joshua was warning the people to choose God, to follow him instead of these other gods. And so we have to make a choice. Moses had warned Israel much earlier, a generation earlier, when he was dying. He said, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you, that I've said before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Moses had said the same thing that Joshua is saying, separated by many years, and every generation has to hear it over and over and over again. And that's why the gospel never grows old. It applies to every generation alike. We have to make a choice. Alexander the Great was asked how he conquered the world. He said, by not wavering. And James says in the first chapter, he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. He said, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Are you unstable about your relationship to Christ? Do you waver in your relationship to Christ? Or are you totally committed to Christ as Savior and Law? Or do you waver about it? Many of you waver by the way you live. And Jesus warned the hypocrites, people who pretend one thing and live another. This was his great battle with the hypocrites in the church. We have old proverbs that are familiar to us all. He who hesitates is lost. Procrastination is the thief of time. A stitch in time saves nine. A bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. Don't waver. Make a decision. Do it now. That's what Joshua was saying. And Joshua, the great military hero that had led them from victory to victory, reminded them of all the victories that God had given. And he said, serve God and live. Serve these other gods and you'll die and come under the judgment of God. And the message has not changed. Now the wars were over. But Joshua found that the people were going toward idolatry. And many times the problems of peace are greater than the problems of war. And he had called all these leaders to Shechem. Now Shechem was a place, the most historical place in all of Israel at that time. And still is today. It was where Abraham had first settled when he left Ur of the Chaldees. It was where Jacob had purchased his parcel of land. It was where the bones of Joseph had been buried when they were brought up from Egypt. And so he has, there are two mountains there. I've stood there. And on one mountain he put 
six of the tribes and on the other mountain he put the other six and Joshua spoke with a mighty voice even though he was an old man. And he reviews the history of Israel and how God had blessed them and how they had won their victories not by their own power and their own strategies and their own ingenuity and their own strength but by the power of God. And the people should have been grateful to God but instead they were now going to other gods. And we in America should be grateful to God for the blessings He's given us. But what do we find? We find that we're worshiping other gods. The gods of pleasure. The gods of lust and greed and hate. The gods of materialism. Even the gods of war. And Joshua tells them that such a condition cannot continue. They must decide whether they want to serve the idols or to serve the living God. And he will not allow any neutrality. Neither does Jesus Christ. And Joshua said, you have to decide immediately now. Choose you this day, not tomorrow, this day, whom you're going to serve. And many of you are going to have to decide tonight. What is the number one priority in your life? Is the priority Christ? Or is the priority something else? Christ demands first place. There's no room on the throne of your heart for two gods. It's either Christ or it's the other God. Because I believe the emphasis must, we must lay it out straight that you cannot serve God and mammon. You must make a choice. And I found that the harder the challenge is, the greater the response. Young people today want a challenge. They want something tough and hard, all right? Give your life to Christ. He'll challenge you because he says you must deny self and take up a cross. He says, I'm going to a place of execution. Come and go with me. Deny your own selfish ambitions and lust and turn to me and go to the cross with me. Now, Paul taught that a Christian is someone who has turned to God from idols to serve the living and the true God. There's a film showing throughout the world this year called The Idol Maker, but a Christian is an idol breaker. And regardless of their decision, Joshua said, it's for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. You know, Adam and Eve had to make a choice in the Garden of Eden. God said, if you want to build a wonderful world, we'll build it together. But I'm going to test you because I've given to you the ability to choose. I haven't made you a robot in which I could punch a button and you would obey me. I've made you in my image. You have the right to choose. So when Adam and Eve faced that choice, they chose wrongly. They broke the law of God. And God said, in the day that you do, you will suffer and die. And man has been suffering ever since. And it's all because of that first sin in the Garden of Eden. And man has been inheriting that tendency to sin ever since. The seed of sin is in us when we're born. David said, in sin did my mother conceive me. Think of it now. At conception, sin was already planted. And then comes the age of accountability, moral accountability, maybe eight or nine or ten years of age, when you are held accountable by God for your actions and you choose to sin. And then the rest of your life, you practice sin. You're born towards sin. You choose to sin at a certain point, And then you practice sin. And the Bible says we have all sinned. And we're all idolaters. Now, Adam had to make a choice, and he made the wrong choice. You have to make a choice. Many of you that are watching by television, I hope that you'll use that telephone number right now and call in and make the choice for Christ and say to that counselor, as for me and my house, I choose the Lord. And then many choices, like the rich young ruler. Remember, he came to Jesus, and he was filled with questions and he wanted eternal life and he said 
Sir, what must I do to find eternal life? And Jesus said, looked at him and loved him and said, go sell all that you have. Give it to the poor. Take up the cross. Follow me. The young man was grieved. He wept. He wanted Christ. But he wanted his money more. Now, if he had said, all right, I'll do it, Lord, I'm sure the Lord would have said, no, it's not your money I want. I want your heart. It's our attitude toward these idols and toward the, these things. The television itself can become an idol. When we walk into the room, all conversation stops and we sort of sit there in reverence watching that box to see if J.R. is going to be shot again. Now, the Bible says we must choose two ways of life. Jeremiah had written, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. There's a way of life, there's a way of death. Which way are you on? Jesus said, I am the way. I am the way. I'm the only way. I'm the only way to permanent peace. I'm the only way to permanent joy. I'm the only way to eternal life. I'm the only way to forgiveness of sin. I'm the only way to the Father. You have to come by me. And that eliminates a lot of people. When Jesus began to talk about dying on the cross, a lot of his followers left him. They said, Lord, we thought you were going to sit up on a big throne and we were going to drive in Cadillacs and we were going to have beautiful swimming pools and lovely ladies and all the rest of it. We didn't really know that you were going to die and wanted us to go with you. We thought this was going to be a kingdom and we were going to overthrow Rome and we were going to rule the world. And that is going to happen someday. But not now. The cross before the crown. Some of us want the crown before the cross. The Bible says there is a way that seemeth right unto a man. But the end thereof are the ways of death. What are some of the ways? Well, some people say, I'm going to follow my conscience, but you don't follow your conscience. Many of us have dead consciences. Your conscience is no longer a safe guide. You've hardened it, you've deadened it. And then other people say, well, I try to be sincere in everything I do. We're, we're here on a football stadium right here. And many years ago, I saw a man pick up a football and he ran 65 yards the wrong way. Now, he was one of the most sincere fellows you ever saw. <laughs> Lost the game. And then there are many people that say, well, you know, I do a lot of good works and I give money to charitable causes and I, I do all that. I, I'm sure God will understand. The Bible says, for by grace are ye saved, through faith, not, not that not of yourselves, but the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, if you could work your way to heaven and pay your way to heaven, you'd get up and say, look what I did. I got myself here by my own good works. The only way you're ever going to make it is to come to that cross where Christ took our sins and our judgment and our hell and identify ourselves with him. And then there are some people that say, well, I'll reform, I, I'll do better. I know people that are always saying, I'm going to do better. But they never do better. They don't have any power within them to do better until they come to Christ. And when you come to Christ, an explosion takes place of power that he gives you to live a new life. I can't live the Christian life. I have no power within me to live the Christian life. The Holy Spirit has to live in me and Christ has to live through me. I cannot live the Christian life. I'm a total flop and failure. Jesus said, enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life and few there be that find it. Few, he said, only a few are going to find that narrow gate and that narrow way, as I said last evening. Are you among that few? 
You not only choose between two ways of life, but you choose between two masters. Jesus said, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and materialism, he says, in Matthew the sixth chapter in the Sermon on the Mount. You have to make a choice. All the way through the Bible, choices, 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 choices. Not only between two ways of life and two masters, but you're going to have to choose between two fathers. Two spiritual fathers. He said in John 8, a very shocking statement. The 44th verse. He said, you are of your father, the devil. And the lust of your father you will do. Now, he says, for many of you, the devil is your spiritual father. Now, you're not aware of it. You wouldn't admit it. But that's the way God looks at it. There's either God, your spiritual father, the true and the living God, Christ, or there is the devil. And then you have to choose not only between two ways of life and two masters and two fathers, but you have to choose between two destinies, heaven or hell. Solomon wrote about the way to hell in Proverbs 7, 27. C.S. Lewis, the great Cambridge and Oxford professor, he taught at both universities used to emphasize, he said, no one ever had so much to say about the way to hell as did Jesus Christ. On the other hand, no one ever spoke of heaven with more clarity and authority as Jesus Christ. And one of the most played pop songs is the Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. Jesus Christ is the stairway to heaven. He is the way to heaven. Come to him. And if you want to come to him, pick up that telephone if you're watching and call that counselor who's waiting to talk to you about the way to heaven and how you can find Christ. He said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Yes, Jesus is in heaven preparing your estate right now. Waiting for you. There is a future life. And eternal life does not begin when you die and go to heaven. It begins here and now when you make this choice for Christ. Because eternity, eternal life comes to dwell in your heart tonight. Jesus Christ is the gateway to heaven. Now this choice also, you must make yourself. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Your father can't make it for you. Your mother can't make it for you. Your children can't make it for you. This is where you must choose yourself. He knew that he could not choose for the tribes of Israel. They must choose for themselves. Man is a social being. However, there's an inner sanctuary within ourselves where we retire from all other fellowships, comradeships, and influences. And there's a lonely arena where the greatest battles of life must be fought alone. And this is a decision that you have to make alone. Moses said, I call heaven and earth to record this day that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that thou and thy seed may live forever. Notice it says thy seed. This has something to do with your children and your grandchildren and your children's children. My son and I were talking tonight about how it passes on from generation to generation, this faith that we have in Christ. The writer to Hebrews recounts how Moses, esteeming the reproach of Christ, greater riches than the treasures of Egypt, choosing rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. He made a choice. Moses could have probably been the Pharaoh of Egypt. He was the son of Pharaoh's daughter, heir to all the riches and power of Egypt. And he made a choice to suffer persecution and the reproach with the people of God. He didn't know that his name would be in history. He didn't know that someday he would lead all of Israel. He didn't know that someday he would be considered one of the greatest men that ever lived. When he made that choice, he made it on the basis of simple faith in God. Some think that Guy Lafler is the world's greatest hockey player. 
And he said a month ago that each of us has only one past, but there are many futures. You see, you can't change your past, but you can determine your destiny by deciding for Christ. And when you do that, Christ changes your past. He wipes out all the sins of the past. Because you see, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses it from all sin. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. When he died on that cross, he forgave all the past. You tonight are reminded of the many sins in your life. The Holy Spirit's bring them to your mind right now. And you know they stand against you at the judgment where every secret thing will be brought out. But Jesus tonight offers forgiveness. But he offers more than forgiveness. He offers justification. Just as though you had never committed a sin. What a wonderful thing to go to bed tonight and know that the past is gone. Forgiven. Cleansed. And God no longer remembers your sins. Yes, and this choice is very urgent. To delay makes the right decision harder. Indecision is itself a choice. Not to decide is to decide not to. Choose now. Nowhere in the Bible does it promise a tomorrow. Come while you can. Time itself makes the decision for you if you don't. You say, but what do I have to do? Three things. You must be willing to repent of your sin. That means to change your way of thinking about your sins and realize how bad they are in the sight of God. Change your way you're thinking about God and say, I love him and I'm going to love him with all my heart, mind and soul.